if the firm doesn't have the discipline of doing accrual base accounting uh, every month, every quarter, and all that's where these things can get away from you. If you run your business by how much money is in the bank, that's not a sign of progressive management. This is the business of architecture. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where each week I speak with a successful architect, designer, or consultant to discuss tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. Today's show is sponsored by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and project management software built with the needs of architects in mind. And for a limited time, startup firms can get two free seats of ArchiOffice for a year. Go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. Today is the second part of my conversation with the former CFO and COO, experienced in leading finance and operation teams in over seven organizations. He has a wealth of experience as a business advisor and CFO for private companies. And with that, here's the second half of my interview with Hugh Glazer, director of the Winterview Group, located in the Boston area. Do you have any? Uh, do you have your finger on the pulse of the hiring environment out there right now? Well, I'm in the Boston area. I know right now hiring has gotten very difficult. Um, finding good people is a challenge. I think companies need to be working on taking good care of the morale of the employees that they have. I have, I very often have clients I help. I'm not a recruiter, but in the course of my networking, help them find people. Um, and I have two situations we've been working on the past three or four months. And uh, I could tell you stories um, about um, things that, that, that people say, including someone coming out of a design related background, telling me, taking themselves out of a search for an architectural firm because they didn't think it was a creative enough environment for them. So, um, it's, it, it's, 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 it's a challenge, uh, particularly in this part of the country country. Yeah. So, yeah. So hiring is getting harder, harder to find good talent, harder to find good people. Without a doubt. Yep. Do you have any suggestions for people who are looking to bring on new talent and hire new people? Uh, there's a couple. So there's a couple questions there. Let's start with this one, Hugh. Um, say we have a small a small firm practitioner, okay, a solo architect who maybe has some outsourced staff right now, but they're sort of at the point where they know they they really want to bring someone on full time because they know that they need that extra help. They're doing so much work by themselves, but it's sort of the chicken before the egg because they're worried that their revenue right now can't really support bringing on another staff member. How would how would should they approach yeah, that? Yeah, that problem? that's a um, that is a big challenge. Um, sometimes uh, the way to handle that is to find a like-minded person with a complementary or or even a practice that that has a different specialty, and that's how you create a firm and you have a yin and a yang. Um, that, that, that is very tough. Um, as someone who's been self-employed in my practice for 15 years, I've often, uh, entertained certain times, uh, changing my business model. And, uh, sometimes you just have to, you know, go for broke. And, and uh, maybe if because you were talking about increased expenses and maybe you start out using outsourced labor and, and people that are not dependent on the weekly paycheck, if you're not comfortable that you can have it there every week yet. Um, it, it's uh, it, that's what being an art that. What being an entrepreneur is that that's where the big risk is, is taking the step forward and saying, hey, we're going to go out on our own and, um, I, you know, and try to make make it bigger and bring on some other people. And I think honesty, um, you know, in terms of sitting down and telling, letting the person know, hey, I would like to work with you. This is what's going on. This is my financial challenges. How do we put something together that works for both of us? Um, I have a background uh, in working with, as a, with uh, what's called a turnaround consultant. So that's companies that are potentially bankruptcy, you know, that severe financial issues. And um, I've learned out of that that you just have to, to explain, put your you know cards on the table, explain it to people, because oftentimes I have to help those companies hire people. 
And it's very difficult finding good conscientious people to come to work for a company that you're telling them right out front, I may not have the money to pay the next payroll. <laughs> so it, 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 so again, it comes back to communication, laying your cards on the table. I find that what works best is you make a connection with people. We all want to work with people that we like because you spend a lot of time with them. And, and one test I learned from someone is if you're having an interview with somebody and you can't see yourself going out having a beer or a drink or, or even a cup of coffee after work, that's probably not a good fit. And you have to, you know, get the working piece of that together. And then, you know, the intrepidation, which is the financial part of what your hypothetical is, that can come, you know, smart people that want to work together can generally find ways, you know, to, to come to a common ground on that. Yep. So uh, how, how can someone know if they're, if they're at that point? How does someone decide whether it really is time to bring on someone full time? Um, well, I have a client of mine. I actually now I think what happens to be an, an engineering related firm. And uh, the senior partner or the founder said to me, I can't keep working 80 hours a week, 52 weeks a year. So there's only one solution to that. You either don't take the work, which <laughs> no one's ever going to say that. I mean, and again, no, well, that's another topic maybe, but when to say no. Um, but you realize, hey, I have to do something differently. Mm -hmm. And if in the meantime, that means maybe I have to reduce my personal pay until I get my leverage off the other resource, that that's just um, the sacrifice you have to make unless you have – access to bank financing or some other way to finance, um, you know, the addition. And, and that as an aside, sometimes if you are doing well as a sole practitioner, maybe that's the way you do it. You start putting some cash aside to help fund a growth plan, mm -hmm. help fund the pay for the first three to six months of a new hire. So that's another way to get there. You know, if you're planning ahead, um, or uh, but sometimes it comes because you land a new contract. Um, depending on the circumstances, maybe if you can get a retainer, that can help fund some of that startup cost. Right. So when you mention the retainer, you're talking about perhaps um, with your clients being able to get some of the money up front to improve the cash flow situation. Yeah, I always recommend that, particularly um, – uh, on a on a bigger project where you do have to redeploy assets or, or dedicate a team, um, is that you try you know if you don't ask you're never going to get it. So it can't hurt to ask to say, and and sometimes it, you know it depends on how big the project is. Um, it could be five thousand, it could be ten thousand, it could be ten fifteen percent. It it has to be tailored to the circumstances. Yep. You know. And one that, thing by the way, I, I apologize for interrupting, but that, then you know the client is serious about going ahead. Um, right. If they're able to pull out their Because that's one of the things I've seen in um, all the work I've, you know, all my years. I, I've got a pretty broad cross section of kinds of businesses that I've worked with, but I see that architects in particular are the most entrepreneurial. They all get, they do a lot of spec work and and um, and whatnot. So they are are good at putting themselves at risk for work that doesn't go forward. And you can only – it's so, you know, tickly pro bono is a word you hear in the legal profession, but effectively a lot of the special work runs the risk of becoming pro bono. Um, so I think that it's important where you can, particularly architects, to try to get a retainer, especially in new relationships. Hmm. Have you ever heard of anyone charging up front for work billing in advance? I'll, I'll say yes, but then tell me more. I think it depends. I mean, completely get paid ahead of time? Yeah, I mean, at least with, uh, with the residential work that I do, I always, look, I don't even want to mess with trying to collect from people later. They pay in advance because we have that relationship. Well, I mean, basically there's a certain amount of trust there, but they pay me in advance and then I do the work. So I just like to bill ahead for the month. Sure. Work. No, I, I think that um, you have nothing to lose by trying it. I actually uh, do that in some situations. A lot of the work I do for, for new or, or restart companies is, is business planning. And I've figured out over the years that it costs 
There's a certain number. It will never cost less than just because it's an intense activity. And there's sort of a range. And 90% of the time, it's at 90% of the range or more because it's just the inherent nature of, of the things that have to be created. And I usually try to get a substantial portion of that up front. Because, again, it's an exercise, sometimes like a speculative design, that if it goes on too long or some other issues come up, people might get tired and they can abandon it. And once they're of that mindset, it makes it harder for the professional to get paid. So, sure, if you can get – you know, that to me would be an expanded retainer <laughs> in that concept, sure. Hugh Wynn um – so some of our listeners may be considering getting a, a business coach or getting someone in there who can help uh, sort of tidy up the books and make sure that they have the systems in place. Uh, when, when a client engages you, what does that look like? Could you walk me through the process of, of how that would look for a client to, to work with someone like yourself? Sure. Usually there's an additional, initial, dis, what I call discovery conversation. We kind of talk about what they perceive the issues are. It's usually me asking a lot of questions, and I tell folks that my job is to help you ask the right questions. It's when you don't like the answers that that gives us a foundation for setting a plan to go forward. Um, so th that's how it starts out, and depending on whether there's some issues that, you, that, you, that either need immediate attention or you can dive right into, often there's an initial starter project, you could almost say, or, or almost like spec design would be um, in an architectural project where we come in, spend some time, reconfirm that the assumptions were correct, reconfirm that the symptoms that are being read correctly. Because a lot of times they'll say, um, I think the office manager needs to be replaced. And what you start finding out is, is the office manager may actually be pretty good. But it's the problem is they don't know how to communicate with the principals, so the information flow is painful. So that's so it you know goes into that sort of initial project, and then coming out of that could be a, either uh, an ongoing retainer kind of relationship about a certain set of services or specific projects, you know that would have a, a task and a, you know a task objective and a timeline. And can you tell me, do you have any stories that you can share with us to help kind of bring this home about what this process looks like or, you know, situations that you came into? You know, you mentioned one about the, uh, the office manager. You know, do you have any other ones that will help to bring this alive for our listeners? Sure. Uh, that actually is pretty close to one. I had a, um, a client or a firm that where the CFO was, would go out to lunch and never come back. The... Um, the office manager never knew the answers to anything, and um, so the uh, the principals and I were were having sort of stealth conversations and meetings leading up to the termination of the CFO, and we were talking about well we ought to be prepared that perhaps the office manager will need to be replaced too, and once that happened, all of a sudden. The office manager immediately demonstrated this whole list of things that she knew were wrong, but the CFO wouldn't listen, and she was afraid that if she went to the partners around the CFO's back, she'd be blamed. So hmm. that was a person that once um, I arrived on the scene was like an unwatered flower, and it um, – you know, blossomed and, and, and she became a major contributor to helping the firm get stronger. Had another situation where um, got a call with a particular accounting or a project management firm management system I'm very familiar with. And the principals were telling a common acquaintance, we put this system in, I don't know what's going on, but we know less about how to get the billing done. We know less about who owes us money than we ever knew before. And what happened was um, they went from, let's call it the off-the-shelf system that um, the bookkeeper was familiar with. They bought a product, a system that was appropriate for them, but the, they left it to the office manager to implement it. And this person was in way over their head. And um, they brought me in about eight, nine months later to basically help them restart the system and train everybody on it. And in the course of um, 
probably 30, 45 days, we had made some major, some major steps forward. There was um, about eight months of cash that had to be reconciled. Well, actually, now that I think about it, it was close to 12 months of cash that had to be reconciled mm. um, and really help them start to get the advantages from the software that they originally intended. So that comes back to when you take on, particularly in smaller firms, these events, putting in a new system, generally only go on once, maybe twice in a 10, 15 year life cycle of a, of a firm. The people in the firm don't have experience, rarely have experience with the new system or generally how to implement that type of project. And that's where they get in. They find out they get in over their head. The prep work is much more than they realize, particularly if you're going from an environment where you had very little project management tools to now you're getting something that's state of the art and understand how you migrate effectively different kind of training, both for the administrative folks and the project team and how to really do it without, you know, creating um, a black hole of, of paperwork and information. So it's that transition, just like yeah, you would plan a pr client project. It's realizing that you don't have the internal skill set to manage what's generally a once or twice, you know, firm mm -hmm. lifetime event. Do you have any favorite uh, project management software or financial uh, software management software that you particularly like? Um, I, I think on a on a broad base uh, this level, um, with not necessarily in the A and E space, uh, I, it's a Microsoft product. It used to be called Navision, but it's now Dynamics NAV. It has a tremendous amount of um, tagging, coding, reporting. It's what I call a, a CFO system, um, and I do believe you can. Uh, deploy that in a professional services environment. In the uh, more traditional system space, you have uh, Ajira, which is a good player. They're now part of Dell Tech. Of course, Dell Tech with Vision is the granddaddy of all of these. There's um, several of the um, cloud-based uh, projects like Financial Force or Intact have professional services uh, deployments that you can use. And it depends on... Um, what you're trying to do, and it's really more about the planning and training of the team. Almost all these software systems can do a, re a, a pretty good job, but it's got to be planned. People have to be trained, and there has to be a firm commitment to ongoing training. You can't just put it in and in the first 30 days before and 60 days after train people and think you're okay because you have turnover. That's another thing that I uh, see a lot when I come into an organization that um, you start asking people questions about why they're using either following certain practices or procedures or ask them about functionality of the software and they'll say, well, I don't know how to do that. And what happens is that three three years out, four years out after the system is implemented, there's turnover. The new people learn what to do from the people that were there before them. And they don't always have the perspective of why that system was picked and why it was deployed that way. So, so keeping up training, I think that, um, you know, in a project management environment, at least every 90 days, there ought to be something like a lunch and learn that's specifically on a topic of how you use the system, how we use the reports from the system, and um, starting at the senior level and project managers so people understand when we were talking earlier about net profit in contribution margin, that they understand what those reports look like. They understand how... Um, their projects are being measured against that um, because I think people like the feedback and they want to know that they're doing a good job. They want to know that they're delivering results for the firm. Um, but, but it requires, again, we're going to come back to, I'll say discipline again. It's that effort to stay on top of it. Keeping their pulse on it. Now, I know that um, for smaller firms, especially sole practitioners, something like uh, Dell Tech, Ajira, et cetera, and are probably a little bit too robust. Do you have any other suggestions? Well, I mean, what, what would you say to people who are maybe a, a little bit smaller in terms of their their uh, their business? 
Well, it, dep- it depends on what you're doing. You've got to have somebody, and sometimes as much as I am a CPA and, and, and love the folks with a traditional practice, and they're not, they don't have a feel for how, what it, what's going on in a, on the day-to-day basis. Sometimes you end up with accounting software that makes it easy to do the tax returns and not run the business. Um, yep. th- systems, there, there are some other s- systems I'm not that familiar with, like Archie Office, I think maybe for smaller folks, um, uh, Ajira now has a cloud deployment, so you could run that as one user. There is a lighter version. You don't have to use all the bells and whistles, um, but it's better to buy something or use something that has, um, growth expansion than something that, and not use what you don't need versus something that basically is just helping you write checks. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. All right. So, Hugh, we've talked about, so far we've talked about um, getting a control on the accounting, the financial management of a firm. We've talked about hiring being one of the major mistakes you see people making is dealing with, uh, you know, HR kind of issues. Any other common mistakes that you see people making, small businesses? Let me, I, let me see here. I had a little list I had made. Let's see if, how, how we are doing on that. Um, well, I think also just as a general concept, uh, particularly for internal initiatives, about where senior management spends time. Um, and if I, can, if I had, can draw a quick graph here. Yeah. Um, And is that visible easily? Mm-hmm. Yep. And this is this is time across the bottom. And what I find is that out here, this is the on this margin, this is the beginning of the project. When you're out here, you got plenty of time, and and this is the where the effort of management should be. And if you if management is paying attention, and we're not going in the right direction, we have plenty of time to fix it, and the cost is less. Usually what happens, people get distracted, management doesn't really spend the time until you're out here, there's less time in the, in the project left, and it's dramatically more expensive to make corrections. Yep. So in, in, the, in the case of um, you know buying a new project management software, some will say, okay, yeah, that's a good idea, go do it. And then the management or the principals or the senior project folks don't really pay attention to the functionality of systems. They don't pay. And then even when the decision is made, they don't spend any time understanding what the setup of it is and what their firm's practice management philosophy is. And then you get close to the end and people go, wait a minute. That's not what I thought we were doing. Um, So it comes back to spending the time at the beginning making sure that everybody is on the same page. Okay. Um, and that probably, as I was playing that out, another a- answer to um, your question is, and it comes back to discipline again, that firms need a project management process. Here's how we, when a lead comes in, here's how we create a proposal. Here's how the proposal gets reviewed internally and prepared. And then when the client accepts it, This is how we deploy to get the project going. Very often, people are working on the project before the contract is signed. They don't understand what phase the work they're doing relates to. So you have to have this management or or philosophy is here's how we manage and deploy a project independent of your software. I mean, the software can help, but everybody has to have an understanding of this is how we do the work. Or manage the work. Yep. All right. So, Hugh, just to, I'm going to summarize that graph for people who are listening and they couldn't necessarily see it. Okay, sure. But we had uh, on the far left hand side, if we're looking at the paper, far left hand side, what we're seeing is that um, the principal time should be spent in that early stages of a project because the cost for corrections is much less and they have a lot more time to fix things. What actually ends up happening is that the time spent, if you go to the, you know, there's a line that's like increasing from left to right, that's what actually happens where, you know, principals are called in at the the later stages of a project when making changes is a lot more difficult and more costly. Exactly. Right. 
All right. So what else is on your list? Is there anything else there that we, what else do you have on there? Well, I think it's very important um, just as, as we're talking about project management discipline is marketing proposals. How do we go about doing, how do we go about finding and winning new business? That whether there's a marketing person that as you're grooming upcoming project managers and future principals that they all have to understand what their responsibility in business development is and that they feel comfortable with that whether it's networking becoming an industry expert on certain topics that you know making rain or, or new business just doesn't happen overnight I think this is a big generational problem there's a lot of firms where the founding fathers and mothers are, are uh, on the you know, tail end of baby boomers. They're now starting to think about retirement and they have to think about what value add do they want to get from their legacy. If they don't have people coming up behind them that can keep and generate the same amount of business that the firm is used to developing, they're going to have exit problems. Um, so I think that early on, as you're developing and grooming project managers and principals to be, they should be active in specific conversations about business development. They should also understand invoicing and collecting the bill. I mean, that's another thing a problem that firms have. It's only the admin folks or the of the core principles that are involved with getting the invoicing done or staying on top of um, getting bills paid. I think people, it's important that if you want to get your paycheck on time, you have to understand that that requires clients paying their invoices on a timely basis. And everybody, um, the more involved the direct project people are, the easier it is clients understand that it's it's personal to them. It's part of how their performance is generated. And, and I think um, those are all elements of things that make for a healthy firm. And I think that also back to the earlier question about employee retention and morale, when employees down into the organization realize that they're involved with invoicing and, and business operation things with clients about, hey, I need to bring a check back to the office, you know, that, that, it, that it, they feel um, more involved with the firm and it's better connects them to the fabric, that they're not just someone out on the floor generating drawings and getting paid, you know, because that's, that's a commodity. It's, it's the relationship part of it and firms and are built on relationships with clients and it's important that the relationships among the members of the firm are focused and productive on, on th these things as well. Okay. So senior firm leaders can look and make sure that uh, younger staff are being developed in terms of being rainmakers, bringing in business, because obviously that's going to benefit people who are wanting to exit the firm. Chris, I think that's critically important that you have to be thinking about that not a year or two ahead of time, but but, oh, yeah. but somewhere 5, 10, 15 years. And, and I would be going back to uh, your uh, other query about someone starting a new firm. Once you, you're in it a couple of years and you have three, four, five people that are, that's not too early to start thinking about where are we going with this? How are we going to build the culture and the process so that you're always have a good foundation to work from. I guess building a business is like building a building. You know, you know there are really a tremendous amount of similarities. There are. Anything, what else do you have on your list, Hugh? In terms of mistakes? Well, I think, you know, um, I think that's sort of the general theme and, and the place where I um, help folks is, is that there's certain times where in smaller firms you need this type of experience or a results, um, but you don't need it or you can't afford it on a full-time basis. So you you know, look for someone that's uh, a business operations person or, or a part-time CFO consultant, someone such as, as I am, uh, and uh, get yourself, don't wait to get yourself the advice and counsel. It, it's, uh, you know, a little bit um, goes a long way in this other example um, that I referred to where, where a firm just didn't do the planning on getting their system in place. It gets much more expensive to take corrective action after the fact than it does to plan it ahead of time. Excellent. Hugh, if people want to reach out to you and engage with you, how, how, do, they, how do they do that? Well, you can um, find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on uh, my website is www.winterviewgroup.com. 
Um, and there's an email address or a way you can reach me at both of those places. All right. Hugh, well, thanks. Thanks for joining us today to talk a little bit about some of the challenges of small businesses, architects, which are one of them, uh, especially the financial management side of things. Well, thank you very much. I've enjoyed it. Okay. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.